Good morning to you, JP, but you've been there because Sunday night was the Arizona Fall League Fall Star. So cool to see all the talent on one field together. Who stood out? Good morning. Laura, good morning again. I love the Fall Stars game. It, it, it's been like 16 years since my last Arizona Fall League trip. I was so glad to be back. And I've got some great news for St. Louis Cardinals fans. Victor Scott II, three stolen bases last night, Lauren. He put on a show great instincts. He shared with me after the game that his father's actually a track and field legend at his college in the Hall of Fame there. And, he, and I was asking him about who would win a race in his family among himself and both his parents who played uh, ran track in college. He said, I'd probably say me. My parents both think they could do it. So just a great athlete who I believe is going to be playing center field at Bush Stadium for the Cardinals in 2024. Now, on the mound, one of my other favorite stories last night, Zach Penrod, he was the oldest player in the game, 26 years young, but what a journey. He's from the town of Nampa, Idaho. He actually was an original signee of the Rangers. He was an outfielder at Corbin University, which is an NAIA school in Oregon that eventually he ends up getting released by the Rangers. He becomes a pitcher. He pitches in one of MLB's partner leagues for three years in the Frontier League and then he was signed by the Red Sox this past year. It looks like he could be on his way to Fenway as a reliever. So remember those names. Victor Scott, Zach Penrod, we'll be talking about them both on MLB Central this year. You're in the right profession, you know that? I mean, the joy with which you talk about these guys is palpable. The AFL Championship game is this Saturday. It is on MLB Network, can't wait for it. Can we talk trade market, JP, for just one second? November 6th, will you humor me? You know I'm a Nats fan. You know I wanted Juan Soto there forever, but there's a little bit of buzz in New York City about where his whereabouts could be in the future. What do you know? Lauren, I think this is going to be an important week for the Padres to see, first of all, how practical it is for them to sign him long term. I think based on the overall payroll situation there, you'd have to say not terribly likely. So in light of that, you've got to do your due diligence at a venue like this as all the GMs gather, all the front office staffs gather to see what the value could be. Now, obviously, we talked earlier in the show about Shohei Otani. He's going to be such a unique force in the marketplace. But I do wonder if at some point in time, whether it's Soto or Pete Alonso, some other guys we'll talk about here in the trade market, do teams just get ahead of it? And if they don't feel as though they're going to be a favorite to land Otani, make the trade instead. It's just a one year left on Juan Soto's deal. You'd have to get a big package back, of course, but I think there is a at least a 50-50 chance, Lauren, that whether it's the Mets or the Cubs or the Mariners, that Juan Soto is somewhere besides San Diego by the time camps mm. open in the spring. You know, Ronald Acuna Jr. was asked who's the one player he'd want to join his team, and without hesitation, he said Juan Soto. I found that so interesting. What about Pete Alonso? I mean, he hasn't wanted to talk about it for a long time. I feel like you and I always have these conversations about what's the comp for him. Is it clear at this point? Lauren, it's a really interesting question because you think about Freddie Freeman's deal. Is that where this could be going for Pete Alonso? Of course, he switched agents recently. That's another idea that probably he is going to go to the open market by the time this season is over. And in light of that, again, it's very similar to Juan Soto. It's almost as though we're talking about these two teams in parallel. Both the Padres and Mets entered 2023 with huge expectations. They both fell short. They both missed the playoffs. There was a managerial change in both places now. And you have to ascertain very quickly, do you feel as though you can compete? Now David Stearns right now just focused on hiring a manager. But I, I think, again, this week as the Mets really put things together, what is Alonzo's trade value? I really think that we'll see how things play out there with a team like the Toronto Blue Jays, the Seattle Mariners. Both of them could use one more bat. Obviously, the Jays already have a first base, but they certainly need a DH potentially. So there's a lot of different thoughts about how they could reconfigure their lineups. I do think, again, much like Soto, we're right around that 50-50 mark of a chance of Pete Alonso being traded. Mm, from managers to players, so many, so many changes coming up in New York. Mike Trout, JP, is next on this list. I mean, last we heard, the organization was open to trading him if he was willing to. That's the last we stood. What's the latest? Lauren, I, I think that Trout is very different 
from Soto and Alonzo. To whereas Soto and Alonzo were just one year productive players, they've been relatively healthy, easy to move. Trout is a different story just based on the injuries and the amount of money he is still due. Lauren, he is still under contract for seven more years at a guarantee of roughly a quarter of a billion dollars. Given that he's had injuries each of the last three years, it's a tough contract to move. And the Angels, especially if they're holding out any hope of retaining Shohei Otani, you really can't trade Mike Trout right now, at least not in the, the immediate term. Maybe you focus more towards the springtime. But, uh, Lauren, again, I, I put the chances of a Trout deal at substantially lower than Alonzo or Soto. Alonzo or Soto, I think we'll be talking about significant moves involving them potentially in the next six weeks. Trout, it's a much later conversation if it happens at all. I do believe he'll be in Tempe, Arizona with the Angels in the spring. Uh, JP, you're talking about from the team perspective. Do we know what Mike wants to do? It's a great question. He has said publicly he wants to stay there. Now, behind closed doors, what is said there, obviously they're still trying to hire a new manager. That's another element there. How would Mike feel about that? He's clearly very comfortable there. But I think we also saw in the World Baseball Classic this year how animated he was, how much he was invested in a, in a winning environment with our colleague Mark DeRosa there in Team USA. I think he wants to get back to that. So I, I would say this, without having spoken with Mike in the last couple of days, uh, I don't believe he has asked for a trade in any way, shape, or form. I don't think he would do that, to be honest with you. But if the Angels came to him and said, Mike, here's a deal that makes sense. It's a place that you would want to play. It will help you go to a winner, and it will help us build for the future. If that's the way it's presented to him, where it's going to help everybody involved, I could see that conversation happening. But, Lauren, the number of teams to where that would make sense, of course, is hometown Phillies. The Yankees need some, some outfield help as well. Those are two teams that come off the, the page right away. But the universe of possibilities that make sense for everybody is not terribly large for Mike Trout. Mm, perhaps a new challenge would be enticing. Never know. J.P. Morosi live from the GM meetings. Thanks so much.